In this video, I'll be walking through my notes on NCA Level 2 Nuclear Physics. A link to the PDF and a list of corrections is in the video description. Past Atomic Models Our understanding of matter has gone through several key developments. Democritus said that matter is composed of indivisible particles called atmos. Aristotle said that matter is infinitely divisible and comes in five forms. Water, wind, fire, earth and ether. Dalton's billiard ball model said that matter is composed of combinable solid masses called atoms, which starts to give us the idea of molecules. Thomson's plum pudding model theorized that atoms consist of a positive mass with negative embedded electrons. The positive mass and negative embedded electrons add to an equal and opposite charge, such that the atom is overall electrically neutral. Rutherford's experiment Rutherford arranged an experiment that cast doubt upon Thomson's model, leading to a new model. The experiment involved firing alpha particles at a thin layer of gold foil. Because alpha particles can only travel a few centimetres in air, the experiment was conducted in a vacuum. Rutherford observed that most particles passed through unaffected, suggesting that the atom is mostly empty. He found that some particles were repelled from their original path. As alpha particles are positive, this suggests that the atom contains a concentration of positive charge. Note that, in actuality, the experiment could not discern if the particles were attracted or repelled. This point is therefore false, but is still commonly required on tests. Lastly, Rutherford observed that a small few particles bounced back, suggesting a small, very dense region of charge. Rutherford's model. Based on the conclusions from the gold foil experiment and further experiments, a new model of the atom was devised. It consisted of a central positively charged nucleus surrounded by a negatively charged cloud of orbiting electrons. While the Rutherford model represents a large advancement in our understanding of the atom, it still could not explain several things. Why electrons do not spiral into the nucleus, atomic spectral lines, which you'll learn about in level 3, and the photoelectric effect, which you'll also learn in level 3. The Bohr model. Several years later, the Bohr model was developed to align with mounting evidence of quantized electron energies within the atom. It consists of small, negatively charged electrons orbiting at distinct distances, and positively charged protons and neutrally charged neutrons existing in a dense central region called the nucleus. Periodic Table Basics The periodic table displays elements in order of size and electron configuration. From our element symbol, we have our atomic number, which is the number of protons. And if the atom is electrically neutral, it is also the number of electrons. And our atomic mass is the combined amount of protons and neutrons. You may ask, why is this a decimal? This is because periodic tables typically give the atomic mass, as an average across all the isotopes, weighted by their abundance. And now to make things simple, here's a table of how to find the amount of any given particle. The proton is always the atomic number, the electron is the atomic number if the atom is electrically neutral, and the neutron is the atomic mass minus the atomic number. Isotopes. While every element has a fixed unique amount of protons, its amount of neutrons can vary. We call these different versions isotopes. For example, there are three main isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen 1 with an atomic mass of 1, Hydrogen 2 where we add a neutron, giving us an atomic mass of 2, and Hydrogen 3 which adds a further neutron to give us an atomic mass of 3. Alpha, Beta and Gamma Radiation In this course we will be considering three types of radiation. Alpha radiation consists of two protons and two neutrons, which is essentially a helium nucleus, it's emitted when a nucleus is too large to be stable, it is the largest and slowest of the three we'll talk about, and because of its two protons it is positively charged. Beta radiation is an electron, which is emitted when a neutron decays, they travel near the speed of light, and since it's an electron, it's negatively charged. Gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave, it's emitted when a nucleus has excess energy, travels at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and has no charge. 
radiation in an electric field. The motion of radiation in an electric field is affected by their mass and charge. If we consider two plates, a positive and negative, establishing an electric field between them, our beta radiation moves against the field because it's negative and has a strong deflection because it has a small mass. Alpha radiation moves with the field because it's positive and has a weak deflection because of its large mass. Gamma radiation is unaffected because it's uncharged. Magnetic force on a charge. A charge in a magnetic field will experience a force. The direction of this force can be described using the right hand slap rule. If we take our right hand, point our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, our thumb in the direction of positive charge velocity, opposite if it's negative, our force is going to be out of the page. Where this symbol here means out of the page, and this symbol here means into the page. Think of it like an arrowhead. If it was coming out of the page, your view would be something like this. And if it was travelling into the page, your view would be something like this. Radiation in a magnetic field. The right hand slap rule can be used to determine how charged radioactive particles deflect in a magnetic field. Consider a field out of the page. Considering our beta particle moving towards the right, Pointing our fingers out of the page in the direction of the magnetic field, our thumb points in the direction of positive charge movement. Because this is negative, we point our thumb in the opposite direction, which is towards the left. Doing so, your palm should be facing upwards, indicating an upwards deflection. We have a strong deflection because of its small mass, similar to the situation with the electric field. For our alpha particle, our fingers are once again out of the page, our thumb points towards the right. Doing so, your palm should be facing downwards, indicating a downwards deflection. Once again, our deflection is weak because of the large mass. And because our gamma ray is uncharged, we see no deflection. Radiation penetration. The penetrative ability of radiation is determined largely by the charge of the particle. The greater the charge, the greater the interaction with other matter. Alpha's two protons give it a large charge and low penetration. Beta's electron give it half alpha's charge and therefore more penetration. Gamma has no charge and therefore has high penetration. And so if we had a paper, aluminium and lead layer, Paper would stop our alpha, aluminium would stop our beta, and lead would stop much of our gamma, though depending on the thickness, we'd expect some to still make it through. I have here a Geiger counter which measures radiation, as indicated by the beeps. By placing a source of beta radiation in front of the sensor, we hear the beeping increase. Adding a piece of cardboard has little to no effect, Whereas this sheet of aluminium stops the beta radiation completely. Now let's test a gamma source. Our sheet of cardboard has no effect as you might expect. Our sheet of aluminium likewise has little to no effect. Even this sheet of lead still isn't enough to stop the gamma radiation, which in some cases can penetrate lead up to several inches. Ionization. Ionization refers to the addition or removal of electrons from an atom. Adding electrons forms a negative ion, removing electrons forms a positive ion. Ranking our radiation by ionization ability, in general more charge, more ionization. And so gamma has the least, beta in the middle, and alpha with the most. We can also characterize two types of ionization. Direct ionization is where electrons are kinetically ejected. This method is used by alpha and beta radiation. So here we see an alpha particle kinetically ejecting an electron from an atom. We also have indirect ionization, where electrons are ejected via secondary processes. This method is used by gamma. So we can imagine a gamma ray incident upon an atom, exciting an electron, providing it enough energy to escape the atom. And while these two pictures might seem very similar, in terms of the physics, they're very different. Radioactive decay. An unstable nucleus achieves stability by shedding energy and mass in a process called radioactive decay. The most common types are alpha, where two protons and two neutrons are emitted from a nucleus, starting with our nucleus with an atomic mass of A and an atomic number of Z. Following the decay, our alpha particle carries away four from the atomic mass and two from the atomic number. Beta decay 
is when a neutron decays into a proton, which is kept, and electron, which is emitted. When our nucleus decays, our beta particle has no atomic mass, and therefore does not affect the atomic mass, but because it has an atomic number of negative 1, we take away negative 1 from our atomic number, which is the same as adding 1. This makes sense because we have taken our neutron with a charge of 0, and ended up with a proton with a charge of positive 1. The charge of the nucleus should therefore increase by 1. Gamma decay occurs when an excited nucleus sheds excess energy by emitting a gamma ray. Starting with our nucleus, with this symbol to show that it's excited, following the decay, the nucleus emits a gamma ray and is now in an unexcited state. This is a cloud chamber. It consists of a supersaturated alcohol vapour, through which particles of radiation create trails of ionised gas particles, which causes the vapour to condense into visible tracks. The current tracks are produced by the small amounts of radioactive isotopes normally present in our environment, and potentially the occasional cosmic ray, which are charged particles, mostly protons, accelerated outwards in the supernovae of distant stars. Let's see what happens when we insert a sample of radioactive lead 210. Lead 210 beta decays into bismuth 210, which beta decays into polonium 210, which alpha decays into staple lead 206, ending the decay chain. As a result, we observe thick tracks left by alpha radiation, and thinner tracks left by beta radiation. Curved trajectories can occur when these charged particles are deflected by an atom, which we call Rutherford scattering. Kinks such as this one here could represent a muon decaying into an electron and two neutrinos. Since particles must be charged to produce these tracks, the negatively charged electron and muon do, and the uncharged neutrinos do not. Half-life. Half-life is a way of describing radioactivity. It is defined as the time taken for half a sample's unstable nuclei to decay. It has the symbol lambda, so if at time equals zero, we have 16 radioactive particles. After one half-life, roughly half of these will have decayed. And after two half-lifes, roughly half of these. Because radioactive decay is random, the predictions of half-life are statistical, not exact. Plotting this on a graph, if we start at an amount of one, following one half-life, we're going to be at half. After a second half-life, we're going to be at a quarter. And after a third, we're going to be at an eighth. Energy and mass. Energy has mass, and mass has energy. This is known as mass-energy equivalence. Described by the famous equation, energy is equal to the mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. This means that one kilogram of mass is equivalent to a very large amount of energy. Roughly the amount of energy released by the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. For a continuous nuclear reaction, we can write the power output as power is energy over time. In the year of 1958, the US Army detonated 35 warheads amongst the Marshall Islands. The test we're about to see detonated a 9 kiloton warhead at a depth of 150 meters. Five years later, a number of governments, including the US, signed a treaty that would ban many forms of nuclear testing, including the one we see here. Nuclear fission. Nuclear fission involves the splitting of a nucleus into smaller nuclei. There are two types of nuclear fission. Spontaneous, which occurs without intervention, where a unstable parent nuclei spontaneously decays into its daughter products. Induced is initiated by an incident particle. So if we have a stable nucleus and fire a particle at it, the resulting nucleus splits into our daughter products similar to before. Once again the difference is the incident particle. A chain reaction occurs when particles released in one reaction are able to induce subsequent reactions. 
Nuclear reactors use chain reactions to achieve self-sustained energy production. Unlike reactors which are designed to achieve a steady rate of reaction, nuclear weapons are designed for uncontrolled, high-yield runaway reactions. Here we have a useful analogy for a chain reaction. We start with one reaction, which has the potential to trigger more reactions, and those reactions more of their own. The result is a rapidly increasing rate of reaction. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion involves the combining of two or more nuclei to form a larger nuclei. Here is one of many examples. Elements lighter than iron can be fused to produce energy. Elements heavier can be fissioned to produce energy. This relationship is described on this graph here, which you'll cover in depth at level 3.